And welcome back. I want to give a special recognition to all our staff that helped us out here. And, and that includes uh, Raina and George and Betty and Sandy and Debbie and Nathan and Ryan and Alex, Katie, and especially my partner Jeff Patino here. He works all year on this stuff. There are DVDs available in the book room if you're interested, and I understand you can get them either just one talk or a whole sec at the end of the show, but the single talks are available now. And I would like to introduce uh, Marie D. Jones. Marie is uh, she's a very funny person. She's a, a Padres fan. She's written something like 30 books many of them uh, inspirational books. Uh, but I was taken uh, by her book called Science, which really starts to uh, get into this whole realm of blending together science and uh, spiritual realms and showing that there really isn't much difference after all. And so I think she'll be talking about that as well as some funny things. So please welcome Marie D. Jones. Well, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming on a Sunday morning. There's a lot of other things you could be doing, like sleeping, for one. Hopefully, my presentation will wake you up a little bit. A lot of you don't know who I am. I was supposed to be here last year, but I was unable to make it uh, due to family circumstance. But I'm absolutely thrilled. Thank you so much, Walter and Jeff, for having me back. I'm going to be talking about quantum leaps, back to the future, forward to the past. You probably that doesn't make any sense. But after this week, and I'm sure you'll understand why it makes a lot of sense. And I've written a few books, and I, uh, I, make, I have no shame about pimping my books out, first thing. But I want you to know who I am and what I've done. So basically, whether searching for the divine or applying physics to the paranormal, these are my first two books, or telling the story of a mighty supervolcano, or examining the myths, prophecies, and predictions surrounding the coming year of 2012. These are my current books. Or the mysterious power of numbers, or the links between mind, matter, and vibration. These are my two upcoming books. I noticed something about my career. I was kind of thinking, do I have a theme here? And I actually do. And this will make my mom happy, because I'm not making a whole lot of money at this yet, but there is a method to my madness. <laughs> it's all been about the same thing. Ancient wisdom and modern science are two ends of the same yardstick that we call reality. And that's why we're here at this conference, to get a better understanding of that. So we're going to focus on my book, Science. And that book focused on the most cutting-edge theories of quantum physics and theoretical physics, and how they might explain paranormal phenomenon, things like ghosts, UFOs, cryptoids, energy vortices, psychic abilities, you name it and also this new science of consciousness that explains how we perceive and possibly even shape and create our own reality. You've heard a lot of speakers yesterday talk about this context or another. It's just really amazing. You'd have somebody get up here talking about the Dogon of, of Africa or ancient Egypt or the Sumerians, and they're all talking about the same stuff, just different terminology. So it's really exciting. There's nothing new under the sun, but there are lots of things we don't know. I am a favor that there is no such thing as new knowledge. Knowledge has always been there. Our job is to remember and uncover it, okay? It's not new. It's kind of like if you have older siblings at home, and when you were a kid, you got handoffs, you got hand-me-down clothing, and your mom justified that by saying, well, it's new to you but it still stunk like your older sister or brother, you know, and it was all tattered, but it was still new to you. And that's how we have to look at knowledge. It's always been there. It's not new, but it's new to us, because we've kind of forgotten about all this. And of course, we're here because we have questions. Who are we? Where are we? <laughs> Why are we here? Where did we come from? 
Are we alone? That's a big one. What happens when we die? This last one is absolutely impossible to answer this early in the season. But you know, we'll do our best. <laughs> so anyway, we're here to ask questions and hopefully get something close to an answer. And I don't know, with Merriman out? So I like to always start with David Bohm's order of reality because I think this is a really interesting, it shows that a physicist is looking at reality in a very similar way to metaphysicians and spiritual people and religious people. It, it, that we have this sort of triune nature to reality. It starts out with the explicate order. And this is the visible world, the outer manifested reality, everything here, every solid and has form. And then there's something called the implicate order. This is the underlying vibratory field of energy beneath the visible world, everything that's hidden and unseen. Okay? There's another order, though, the super implicate order. This is sort of like a god force. I hate to use the G word, but sometimes it comes in handy. This is the higher universal consciousness and order that permeates all of reality, sort of like the overlord order. And what Baum was trying to tell us is that everything is connected at the ground level and that all three of these realities are in play at the same time. We are only aware of the explicate order, but that doesn't mean there is not that hidden order that we're, I think a lot of us, because we're here at this conference, we're obviously interested in those other two orders. Again, the triune nature of reality is something that I uh, wrote a paper years ago about the Trinity symbolism, and uh, it was for ministerial school, believe it or not. I was absolutely shocked by how many times I saw the idea of a Trinity or a triune nature come up in everything from creation myths of ancient civilizations, mythology, um, even psychology, where you have the id, the ego, and the superego. I mean, there always seemed to be this triune nature. And of course, the holy. The idea of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if we go back to the explicate, implicate, and super implicate, we could see that the Father is the super implicate, that sort of God force. The Son is the explicate, the manifest reality. And then you need like an activating agent, the Holy Spirit, to get things going. And that would look it. So here, right away, we have linked religion with modern science. Who would have thunk? You know? Obviously, David Bohm did. But mainly we're talking about energy when we talk about reality. What is energy? How does it behave? How does it operate? How does it move? We'll be talking a little bit about the paranormal, and that, of course, involves energy, different ways that energy might be act acting in other realities and then manifesting in our reality. So basically, the law of conservation of energy is where we start. Okay, energy doesn't stop being there. It doesn't die. It does not cease to exist. It forms, but the total amount of energy never changes. And I liken it to recycling, OK? Today's newspapers, tomorrow's grocery shopping pad. It's not the same, but it's still a form of energy. Pretty simple. Energy is also nature's way of keeping score. We sense the presence of energy only when the score changes, when something happens, right? There's either a transformation from one form of energy to another, or a transformation of energy from one point to another. So, I mean, you can pretend I'm energy. If I'm just standing here, you're not going to notice me. But if I start, you know, getting down or something, you're going to notice. That energy is tr uh, transforming energy from one point to another, changing form. If I were to shape shift into a wolf, trust me, you'd notice. Okay? Isn't this like physics 101 kind of? <laughs> So my question when I wrote science, and what has driven a lot of my research and my writing is, could paranormal phenomena be an example of these transfers of energy from one form to another, or from one spatial or temporal point to another? In other words, what is this stuff? Where is it coming from? How is it getting here? So we want to start off with some basics of quantum theory to get an idea of just how bizarre operated the subatomic world. And the reason why we do that is because if we're going to look at how energy behaves, let's start off at the most basic fundamental level. We can theorize from there what might be happening at the macrocosmic level. And I've got to tell you, I've been immersed in the world of UFOs and ghosts and all that kind of stuff for years. I started reading about this stuff. I thought this was like way more paranormal than the paranormal. All of a sudden, the paranormal became totally mundane. 
Wave particle duality, this is a very fundamental basic of quantum theory. I'm sure a lot of you know all about this. But for those of you who don't, all matter and energy are both wave-like and particle-like properties. Okay, it's not one or the other, it's both. This is a central concept of quantum mechanics. It's also called, uh, where, are, where am I? Oh, here we are. Okay, so uh, in describing the behavior of small-scale objects, we can't really say this is a particle or this is a wave. Something happens first. Until the wave function is collapsed, and what that means is until there is an observer brought into the picture, the wave stays a wave. Once it's collapsed, once it's observed, it becomes a fixed position. So if you think about it, if everything that we see is sort of a mishmash of waves, it doesn't become fixed into a podium or a Marie D. Jones or the stage until an observer collapses that wave function through the act of observation. And we're trying to understand all of the dynamics involved in this. And this happens so quickly. I mean, you can't, you can't kind of get in there and like not collapse the wave function and see it all still as a wave. Okay, not quite yet. Uh, but it happens so quickly that we automatically see what we assume and expect that we're going to see as our reality. But until then, it's in a state of what's called solution. It has no position, it's above position. There was this guy in 1927 named Erwin Schrodinger, who was an Austrian physicist, and he decided to do a little messing around with cats. But before you animal rights people get your shirts in a dither, he didn't use any real, he did what's called a thought experiment. He took a kitty cat, he put it in a lead box, and in that lead box there was also a, oh, a, a cylinder filled with cyanide, a little hammer, a counter tube, and some radioactive substance. His theory, his, what he wanted to know is if one of those atoms decay, and it triggered the hammer to crack open the vial of cyanide and kill the cat, or if the atom did not decay, and therefore there was no trigger and no cyanide release and no dead cat. What he was trying to understand is what happens before you open the box to take a look at the cat? Because you don't know. You don't know if the atom decayed or not. So until you open that box and observe the cat, it is in a state of superposition. It is dead, it's alive, and it's everything in between, including really, really pissed off. So, but you know, this is an amazing thought experiment. Think about it. We're in this auditorium. This is what he was kind of implying. No windows. We can't see outside, but don't we just assume that if we go open that door up there, there's going to be a lobby out there and people outside on the campus? I mean, we just make that assumption. What he was trying to say is that may not necessarily be so. There may be nothing out there, folks, but the, the nano, nano, nanosecond, you open that door, you're collapsing the wave function and seeing what you expect to see. Kind of creepy. And, and don't try this at home, because look, I've tried to open that damn door as quickly as I could. Just no way. I mean, you know, even if you try to sneak up on the door, you know, you're like, I mean, you, you're not going to see the wave function before it's collapsed. You're going to collapse it. So don't try that. Save you some time. But anyway, this was a really great thought experiment that actually led to some other similar theories that we're going to look at. High uncertainty principle. These guys have like the coolest names for these things. There is an uncertainty in position of any subatomic particle. You cannot know both the position and momentum of a particle simultaneously with accuracy. And that makes sense. The particle is moving. You can't know both its momentum and its fiction. You got to stop the thing. Okay, so until the damn thing stops, you can't fix the position on it. And that's a little bit of an offshoot of the um, Schrodinger cat idea. Copenhagen interpretation. This takes it a little bit further. In the quantum world, nothing is real until an observer observes it and collapses the wave function, giving it fixed position and form. Until the point of observation, it's nothing but a potentiality. That's kind of spooky, folks. That means that we can be literally observed reality into existence as we go along. The attention or will of the observer has a direct influence on the subjective reality. It's possible, too, that it has a direct influence on our objective reality. Perhaps 
when we collectively collapse the wave function, that results in us all seeing the same thing. And hey, you know, these are theories that are really being, have been taken seriously. I'm not just up here making this stuff up to get you to buy my book. <laughs> Take it another step further. This is where it gets really cool. Many worlds interpretation. It took that, that idea that nothing is really real until you look at it. It sort of flipped it on its head a little bit. Everything is real until you look at it. Okay, there's a little difference there. Until the wave function is collapsed, everything exists in a state of superposition, like the cat in the box. But here's what happens. There's an infer of universes slash worlds that exist alongside our own, where another choice or outcome is real. And what that means is, let's go back to uh, Schrodinger's cat. He, you open the box. In universe A, the cat's alive. But at that instant, another universe branches off. The cat is dead, universe B. And you've got universe C, where the cat had a litter while it was in the box. Okay, and then you've got universe D, where there's a dog in the box. And this just keeps happening and happening and happening, and that's the many worlds theory. And of course, that leads into parallel universes, which we're going to get to in a second. But what I really thought was cool, I always remembered that quote, that, you know, when Christ said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I thought, wow. And then when I got into this stuff, it made sense. It's like, he's talking about parallel universes. What else could it be? Unless God has a big, huge mansion in Monticello, you know. <laughs> Parallel universes. This is the more modern, becoming very widely accepted theory that is sort of an, was started out with those other theories. They all kind of lead to more and more good stuff. And of course, you got a lot of the same people working on them, too. So they're always progressing. But this is the idea, again, that an infinite number of universes may exist alongside our uh, and they're accessible through some mechanism by which energy moves. But before I, I tell you about that, there are a couple of different ideas about parallel universes. You know, some uh, physicists will tell you that they think that we can access them somehow. Maybe not now, but later. And there are some that will insist that we never can, that just the mathematical laws by which they operate are probably so completely different from our own. But it's interesting that someone like Michio Kaku, who was uh, mentioned in one of the talks yesterday, I forgot exactly which one, is becoming more and more open about talking about parallel universes. I actually saw him on a program about a year ago talking about the triangle and how he thought that might be an Earth-based wormhole. Wow, I mean, this guy is a brilliant theoretical physicist. But he's very much in favor of the idea that we will one day be able to, to traverse a parallel universe. And a lot of people believe that we might need to come up with some kind of, or discover some exotic map, keep it open long enough to not turn us into a little string of spaghetti. But, you know, there's still some issues. But it really is possible. And that would be, mainly right now, the big theory is wormholes. A wormhole is nothing more then a shortcut through the space-time continuum. And there's different kind of wormholes. So there's wormholes that can get us from one point to another point in our own universe. There are wormholes that can get us from point A to point B in parallel universes. But there's also wormholes that can get us to point A and point B in time. Okay, so now we're dealing with not just spatial but temporal wormholes. So again, <laughs> I mean, does this sound like, you know, does this make ghosts sound kind of mundane or what? And this is definitely stuff that is being talked about in the halls of academia. We have another theory. This theory also requires a potential means by which paranormal phenomena and any kind of energy could be moving between different levels of reality. It's kind of like you have to look at reality like an onion, and we keep peeling away layers. Some theories say those layers are universes. Some say they are what string theory leads into, and that's the idea that we layer additional dimensions, spatial, possibly even temporal. So string theory is, it, it's fallen out of favor a little bit with some physicists, but it's picking up steam with others. And basically what it states is that the most fundamental unit of matter are vibrating strings, little, you know, imperceptible strings of different lengths, some are open, some are This theory must include alternate dimensions to work in a mathematical sense, and I'm not going to get into why it would require me to like write a whole bunch of equations up there that even I don't understand, so you can read up on that on your own. So in addition to our three spatial and one temporal dimensions, we have four-dimensional people.
we now need to look at the fifth dimension. Okay? And I believe, I think it was Robert yesterday that brought up the, uh, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. For any of you that are baby boomers, this is the group that did it. If you're too young, then hey, your music sucks. Anyway, <laughs> I just gave away my age, didn't I? Um, anyway, no, I love music today. Um, but we're not just talking about five dimensions. We're talking about 12, 13. There's one, I think it was the boson string theory that required 26 dimensions. We can't even fathom that because we're told that these dimensions, some of them may be so curled up and tiny, they're absolutely imperceptible. There's no way we could ever get inside one and see what goes on there. But a lot of physicists are now telling us they may be infinite in size, and they're like right here. You know, we're, we're like sharing space with this stuff. It's kind of like parasites, you know? Maybe not parasites, but anyway, so this is really exciting stuff because what it does is it opens doors to opportunities for us to kind of discuss, is this how other realities are manifesting in ours? Is this how entities from somewhere else, wisdom and knowledge from somewhere else, could be somehow kind of squeaking through into our reality? Entanglement, this is a very fundamental concept of, of quantum physics and what's really exciting is I have something I want to read to you guys because there are experiments being done in human entanglement right now. Entanglement is the idea that if two particles come in contact with each other at some point, they will remain so of time and they will be able to affect each other instantaneously. When one spins vertical, the other will spin automatically, horizontal, it doesn't matter how far, they could be billions of light years away. Now what this says is that our particles, when we come in contact with other particles, we never, we're never not connected. And going back to David Bohm, who thought there was this incredible ground state, this connectedness to all of reality, well, entanglement actually kind of lends support to that idea. But I wanted to read you real quickly. There's an experiment going on, and we don't have results yet, in a, a man by the name of Gissin, G-I-S-I-N, I don't know if you heard about this, at the University of Geneva, he's doing experiments with human entanglement, and they involve literally doing the same experiments that John Bell did in his non-locality experiments, but doing them with humans to see if people, when they come in contact with each other, if their particles are not the only thing that stay entangled. Now, you and I, that's true. When you meet somebody, even if you pass a stranger in the grocery store and you smile at them, you know, you're entangled in a sense. Now, what does that mean in the bigger picture? Psychic abilities, remote viewing. I mean, if our particles are entangling with everybody, does that, is, does that explain how I might be able to know before my mom calls that it's her? Or is it, that's just the fact that she calls me 85 times a day, you know? But anyway, this opens the door to psychic abilities and things like remote viewing. The idea that once we are entangled, and we are all entangled, I mean, I think that now is entangling us even more that we are still connected, and we should be able, on some level, to communicate with each other. Another theory, this one's really cool, the holographic universe, the idea that the universe is a hologram with all of reality evident within each smaller section. You know, if you break off a piece of a hologram, you're going to have the, Im the whole image will remain in each piece. Now, what, what this appears to be, though, is that, as if our reality is a projection from somewhere else coming onto our three-dimensional plane. Where is it coming from? Who's projecting it? Can we get to that other reality? Probably the most interesting theory that I did my research into, and one that I think really can explain just about anything, is the zero-point field. Hal Pudov, who's a physicist and who has done a lot of research into the use of zero-point energy, if we can learn to extract the energy in this field, we might be able to give up fossils. He called it a self-regenerating grand ground state of the universe, where quantum fluctuations perme permeate space. In other words, it's kind of like quantum foam, and there's particles and popping in and out of existence. And there is no such thing as empty space, according to the guys that believe in the zero-point field. Zero-point energy jiggles. It has vibration. It resonates even at baseline zero values. That's why we call it zero-point field, or zero-point energy. This field contains within it, and this is a more metaphysical concept, but, you know, it's being discussed again by some physicists who are looking at this as sort of this source of all sources, or if you like Star Wars, the idea of the force, 
where everything is contained within that force. And, and it's a creative, generative force. So it contains within it all matter, form, energy, and the entire landscape of time, past, present, future. There's no linear time in the field. It's all there. If you want to think of the universe as a giant quantum, which gets into information theory, which we're not going to talk about, um, you could consider this where all the its and bits of information that make up our universe are dumped. It's like a repository. Okay, Edgar Cayce, I believe, referred to it as the Akashic Records or the Akashic Field, the, the Book of Life from the, the Old Testament. Um, king, uh, Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is all around you and within you and all through you, and yet you do not see it. I think he was talking about the zero point field. But here's the question. If it's there and if it's permeating everything and if it's filled with every thought, action, deed, matter, form, you name it, can we tap into it? And maybe are people already doing that? So when we're dealing with paranormal phenomena, phenomena, energy changing form. Okay, we know that energy doesn't cease to exist. Think of something like, say, ghosts or apparitions as, as energy that has changed, not just form, but like we said earlier, changed a point in spatial or temporal time. Energy vortices, apparitions, UFOs, cryptoids, which are cryptozoological animals. And I've got to tell you something from the field. The uh, reports of cryptozoological entities are on the rise. They are skyrocketing. And I'm a firm believer that this has something to do with the psyche of human beings. That's a whole other lecture. And I hope to write a book about it one day because it's really kind of strange that we go in cycles with phenomena. We went through a UFO cycle about 20 years ago that was huge. Now we're in the ghost cycle. All you got to do is turn on TV and see ghost hunters and ghost chasers and ghost killers and, you know, taking a ghost to the bar and whatever. But the next big thing are these cryptozoological entities. What is going on here? Are these guys coming from the zero point field? They cut their universe another dimension to visit us and why and can we get rid of them? Because <laughs> a lot of them aren't friendly. So anyway, how does it get here? A lot of the theories that we talked about open the door, wormholes, parallel universes, alternate dimensions, the zero point field. These are all, I don't like to necessarily use them going to because people who are much more well respected than me that talked here this weekend have used it. Could they be portals? to these other realities that physicists are telling us they're pretty sure are there, okay? If you peel that onion when you get to the core, is everything coming from the core? And as it comes its way through the onion, we get to see a little bit more of it. Big question, what is our involvement with manifesting paranormal phenomena? Can anybody see a ghost? And I actually am working with someone who is the head of one of the biggest um, paranormal investigative research group tree. And we are going to be looking at whether or not we can psychologically trigger paranormal events by using um, groups of, different groups of people. And we'll keep you posted on that because that's really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a believer that we create our own reality. So if that's the case, why haven't I seen a ghost yet? <laughs> I mean, I'd really do. I write about them. But it's got to have something to do with the key. And the key is the observer. Well, what about the observer? Consciousness, OK? The C word. What seems to be happening in the study of paranormal and unknown anomalies is that more and more people are talking about the role that consciousness in manifesting any kind of paranormal event. But not just that, our, our manifest reality, all of this. Consciousness is obviously key. Human consciousness seems to be the key to the observation of a quantum experiment. Now, if that's the case at the quantum level, does it also apply at the macrocosmic level, the level that we're on, and the cosmic level as well? Are we observing our reality into existence? Wow, what kind of power would it give us to do that, huh? Does consciousness serve as the link between our brain and the perception of paranormal phenomena? A lot of people think that the brain is what triggers these events, okay? I don't believe that. I think the brain is a receiver, it's a receptacle, and that consciousness is the trigger, it's the activator. And I'm not alone in that thought. Are we consciously triggering or creating the events themselves? And there's evidence that yes, we are, but there's also evidence that a lot of this stuff is indeed coming from the outside. 
It's coming from that explicate order. So how do we explain if we have the, as the observer are able to observe a ghost into reality? Because that's what quantum physics tells us. But we also have some evidence that tells us that that ghost is there whether we're there or not. I mean, that's a big paradox there that we figure out. Resonance, my next book, I just finished a book, my next book with, with my partner Larry Flaxman is gonna be called The Resonance Key, Exploring the Links Between Vibration Consciousness and the Zero Point Grid. Zero Point Grid is the field, but we think that the infrastructure reality is more grid-like. Resonance, the R word, this is really coming into favor. I'm hearing it on the lips of everybody, whether they're talking about science, paranormal, ancient wisdom, this, that, the other thing. Resonance is vibration, that's all it is. And it could possibly explain everything. All of nature, it's light, energy, matter. You know, we're not solid, we are vibrating. We're frequencies, we're, we're always moving. We're made up of particles that are moving around. I mean, we look solid, but at our fundamental nature, we're not. When matter or energy syncs up, when it synchronizes, when it's, up, when it's coherent, can it open a doorway or the P word, portal, to a new manifestation or energy. Can resonance be the mechanism by which something from one universe or alternate dimension engages in crosstalk with ours? And I love to, uh, kind of using the CB radios. I used to listen to them when I was a teenager. God knows why. But uh, you, know, you hear one trucker talking to another, and then this third trucker would kind of, you'd hear his conversation kind of breaking in. It's crosstalk. Maybe that's what's happening here with paranormal phenomena. We're getting crosstalk from some other dimension or some other universe. And that's why this stuff is so inconsistent and so scattered and so very hard to duplicate in a laboratory setting, which is one of the reasons why science shuns it. Claude Swanson wrote a great book called The Synchronized Universe, and I really like his theory. He has this theory that the, we may be part of stacked universes, top of the other. And so when energy crosses more than one sheet, they look like sheets, more than one synchronized universe layer, then this structure will appear non-physical and yet can remain stable. This may be the form of subtle energy in higher dimensional structures such as the soul. And it also may allow for travel between the sheets. Higher dimensional structure can span many sheets corresponding to stable universes. These can bring knowledge or energy from other dimensions. The problem is you have to have coherence. You have to have resonance between those sheets because otherwise you end up with random noise. And we heard a couple of people yesterday talk about how if science doesn't understand something, they call it noise. There is noise out there. When things cohere, we might actually get something. When they don't, there's no paranormal phenomena whatsoever. There's just random noise. So if we want to try to think about what our role is in terms of resonance, consciousness, all of this stuff, well, let's pretend that we're raised a really simple way to look at it. Okay, we can tune into different resonant frequencies. And I know, again, Robert talked a lot about resonant frequencies yesterday to experience different realities, okay? There are an unlimited number of stations out there, but our role as observer, our consciousness will choose the station that we want to get. That doesn't mean those other stations are not out there playing their music. The airwaves are full of different kinds of stations you can tune into. If you want right-wing talk radio, you got it. If you want sports talk, you got it. We, our brains, our consciousness, we are tuning in to specific stations. That becomes our reality. That does not mean that those other stations are not out there cramming up the airwaves. So if you decide you want to tune into a different bandwidth, you might get a whole different reality. Now, I'm not saying that that's easy or something that any of us can do at the snap of a finger, but in theory, it makes sense. So the zero field, like the kingdom of heaven or the Akashic field, may be the playing field, may be the airwaves from which we decide what station we're going to tune into, where we're going to put our focus, our consciousness, our attention, you name it. What do the ancient civilizations know? Okay, I don't have to repeat everything that was... You guys heard the speakers, there's some more coming this morning. They knew all about this stuff. They had different terminology for it. They used different words, pictures, images, but they were saying all the same thing. And, you know, I was sitting here yesterday listening to Laird talk about the Dogon, and I'm like, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. It's just new to us. It's been forever. Religions, world mythologies, they're rife with references to new science and quantum physics concepts. And I could 
tell you a whole bunch of them, but I'd have to be here for another hour, and Walter would get the big metal hook, and I don't like that thing. But, you know, we hear that resonance, harmonics, vibration, might have been behind the building of great structures, like the pyramid and, and you know, these stone uh, hinges and, and whatnot. And our ancestors may have been more prone to psi abilities because of a survival need. This is really important. Brian Josephson, who's a physicist, did a study many, many years ago where he determined that psychic ability, clairvoyance, precognition, ripping, may have been, to our ancient ancestors, a survival mechanism. They had a need to know how to use those abilities because they didn't have computers, they didn't have television, they didn't have anything to assist them in finding food, water, knowing where the predators were, or in determining where they needed to move. These were nomadic people. So this sort of need to know idea makes sense if you think about how we live now. We are so inundated with information. Okay, say we get 100 pieces of information coming at us a minute. We're only going to focus on the 20 pieces that help us get through our day, that get our kids off to school, get jobs that we can't stand, to deal with the boss that we hate, you know, get us on that commute, get us home, eat dinner, whatever. We are focused on those 20 bits of information. Well, what about the other 80 bits? Ancient peoples may have needed those other 80 bits a whole lot more than we did, which is why maybe they were able to develop their psychic abilities. Do we need psychic abilities? Why do I need ESP when I can sell, you know, pick up my cell phone and text somebody in Europe? I mean, we've lost that ability because we've lost the need. So this is a really interesting theory that Brian came up with, and it does make sense if you think about it. So knowledge of the past is knowledge of the future. Okay, one is called wisdom, the other science. But like I said before, they're both ends of the same yardstick. You got one here, one here, you got all the stuff in between, but it's the same single yardstick of reality. We do not discover niche. We simply uncover what already exists, but we haven't been able to remember, or we're just now remembering. I think we're way ahead of the game. Anybody who's in this auditorium is obviously ahead of the game. You're interested, you want to know, you want to uncover some of this lost knowledge. I like this one. The spouse is always the last to know. <laughs> I've got it, you know? We in the present are the last to know. If we think about future civilizations, they're going to know everything, right? We think about past civilizations, they seemed to have known everything. We're stuck here going, okay, where is our place in the universe? But this is such an exciting time to live. And, you know, I would rather live now when we're uncovering things. That is so cool. My life's work now is devoted to uncovering what's already out there and as are all of the speakers that have been here this weekend, nothing is new under the sun or any other suns in any other universes. Knowledge, it's there, okay? There's no linear time out there. Everything is already there. We just need to find ways to access it. So I don't know if we have time for some questions. Guys. <laughs> couple of minutes if anybody has a question or anybody has any knowledge to impart or share or a, a good football joke nothing <laughs> well thank you so much for coming here early on your Sunday morning and listening I hope you got a little bit of interesting stuff out of this and uh, you got a few more great speakers coming up so thanks for coming to the conference